Okay, so as people trickle in, uh, we are going to get started. I want to say good evening. Buzu, hey, Shikoli. Welcome to the second online participatory reading of the 94 Truth and Reconciliation Commission Calls to Action event. My name is Carla Du. I am the student facilitator of this event, which is hosted by the Social Justice and Peace Department Studies Department and the Center for Social Concern of King's University College. I will be the moderator for this evening's event. Uh, I want to acknowledge that tonight's event was in inspired by a similar event that the University of British Columbia hosted, and we are honored to have one of the UBC organizers participating with us tonight. We have a lot to fit into our evening, but before we begin with opening remarks from Paula Cornelius Hedgepeth and a grounding and blessing from Elder Myrna Kiknosfwe, I have a few housekeeping items that I want to share with you. First, please keep your video and mic turned off during the event. Only those who are reading a call can, will turn their video and mic on when it is their time to read a call. Second, we want to respect everyone's time and know that it is a challenging time of year. If tonight's event goes beyond 8.30 and you need to go, you are welcome to log off. We hope that you will be able to stay for the event in its entirety. Finally, if you have any technical questions or difficulties, please send a text or call Adam Taylor and uh, we will put the phone number in the chat. Thank you for your patience, for your participation, and for your willingness to learn, seek truth, and work towards reconciliation with our Indigenous neighbours and communities. Dr. Allison Larkin, Chair of the Department of Social Justice and Peace Studies and Co-Director of the Centre for Social Concern at King's University College will give the land acknowledgement. Good evening. My name is Allison Larkin, and I am very grateful for the opportunity to share a land acknowledgement and reconcilia reconciliation attestation this evening. There are many ongoing uncomfortable truths with which we must acknowledge and confront to fulfill our responsibilities to the 94 calls to action for truth and reconciliation, as well as the 231 calls for justice for the missing and murdered Indigenous women's inquiry. This evening, in addition to acknowledging the land that we gather virtually on, I want to speak in solidarity with the women of Winnipeg, where they are once again fighting to get help to find the remains of missing and murdered Indigenous women. The words of the poet Tanaya Winder and her poem, Love Lessons in a Time of Settler Colonialism, to me eloquently capture the unbearable grief of loss suffered by so many families and communities. So I'll share them with you now. They too know all too well that some cracks were built just for us to fall through. We live in a world that tries to steal spirits each day. They steal ours by taking us away. From industrial schools to forced assimilation, Genocide means removal of those who birth nations. Our living threatens. Colonization has been choking us for generations. I tell my girls they are vessels of spirit, heirs to lungs expanding. This world cannot breathe without us. There are days I wish I didn't have to teach these lessons, but as an Indigenous woman, silence is deadening. There is danger in being seen. Our bodies are targets marked for violence. We carry the Earth's Me Too inside us, a howling wind. Our mothers and their mothers swallowed these bullets long ago. The voices ricochet, I wish I were invisible. I wish I were invisible. I wish, echoes in my eardrums. We know what it's like to live in fear. Colonialism's bullet sits cocked, 
waiting behind a finger on a trigger. We breathe and speak and sing for survival. We carve out in lines. We write, I know joy, I know pain, I know love, I know love, I know. Lessons we've carried throughout time. Should I go missing? Don't stop searching. Drag every river until it turns red and the waters of our name stretch a flood so wide it catches everything. And we find each other whole and sacred, alive and breathing and breathing and breathing. I want to acknowledge that the campus of King's University College is situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lunapuak, and Chalongton peoples, all of whom have long-standing relationships to the land of southwestern Ontario and the city of London. The First Nations communities of our local areas include Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie, Delaware Nation. In our region, there are 11 First Nations communities, as well as a growing Indigenous urban population. King's University College deeply values the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations, and all of the original people of Turtle Island, also known as North America. Thank you very much, Allison. Uh, we are now going to call on pa Paula Cornelius Hedgepath. Uh, Paula is a Haudenosaunee woman from Oneida Nation of the Thames First Nation and the Wolf Clan. Paula is the Community Relations and Space Coordinator of the Office of Indigenous Initiatives at Western University. Before, before Paula gives the opening, we wanted to acknowledge and celebrate the launching of the Wampum Learning Lodge, the new home to Western's Indigenous Initiatives and a place of cultural re rec reclamation, reclamation, reconciliation, revitalization and respect. We call on Paula now. Sagoli. Sagoli Swagwe, Gahawani Nuggets, Otayuni Niwiga Deloda, and Ida Ag Niwiga Hajo. My name is Paula Cornelius Hedgepet, and as mentioned, I am a Haudenosaunee woman from the United Nation of the Thames, and I belong to the Wolf Clan. I'm a mother to two amazing sons who inspire me to do better every day. Good evening, everybody. Let me begin by saying what an honor and a privilege it is to be here and to provide some good words to open this event. I want to first acknowledge the gracious and important work and intention being put forth by King's University College here tonight to remind us all that this work is ongoing and that there is still a lot to be done. Thank you for inviting me to open this reading of the 94 Calls to Action. When I was asked to open this event, I did um, some reflections about what reconciliation means to me and what I've been hearing from community members and as well as um, what, reconcil what reconciliation looks like in the work that I do here at Western. So reconciliation can and does look different to many people whether you are Indigenous or non-Indigenous, the word means something different when you hear it. I think it is a complex concept. It embodies many ideologies, all of which take a lot of work. For Indigenous peoples, I often hear that reconciliation is not for us or that this work is not work that we need to be focused on. I hear them and I understand what they are saying. To me, reconciliation is supporting Indigenous peoples in ways that will assist with cultural reclamation, reclaiming practices that we knew and had a solid grasp on pre-colonization. 
It also means rectifying the harms done to Indigenous peoples post-colonization. I think it might also mean stepping back and letting us as Indigenous people determine how to best proceed and lead. This is what I know and feel. Reconciliation means to restore friendly relations. Sorry. Um, reconciliation means to restore friendly relations. I'm not entirely sure I agree with that definition as it applies to what we are doing, especially in higher education institutions. I feel that definition and responsibility sits with the government. There is a lot of work to be done to reconcile the relationship between Indigenous people and the government, and you will hear about it throughout the readings tonight. I'm not working to reconcile relationships because that would imply that there was something done to harm our relationships with each other. The relationships I'm building within these higher education institutions and the communities within are new and built on transparency and respect. I am humbly trying to guide and lead non-Indigenous visitors, colleagues, students, and community members towards an understanding and a relationship that will thrive and that will assist Indigenous peoples in the short and long term. This is what we are working towards. And of course, we do this work with Indigenous community blessings, direction, and guidance at every step. Reconciliation began with the TRC Commission and the bravery of many of the residential school survivors who came forward to speak the truth about the traumatic experiences many shared. It is complex and deeply embedded within our communities now. We are actively working to heal that generational and intergenerational trauma. From that came the 94 calls to action. I was asked if I would be willing to read a favorite or one that resonated with me. And I thank the organizers for the invite to do so, but I could not choose one. Each of those calls to action resonate with me as a Haudenosaunee woman, as a daughter, a granddaughter, a great granddaughter, a mother, a sister, an auntie, and as a human. One with family that attended residential school and day schools. One that has family stories of government abuse and personal trauma. All those calls to action impact me in one way or another, whether it is my immediate family, my extended family, or my communities. In 2019, the Yellowhead Institute released a Calls to Action Accountability, a status update on reconciliation, which I encourage you to read. In 2016, five of the 94 calls to action had been completed. In 2017, the number rose to seven. In 2018, it increased by one. In 2019, we had a total of nine complete calls to action, only nine. If that is the pace, then we can reasonably assume 15 or so calls to action are completed today, maybe. We have a long way to go if we are truly invested in seeing these calls action and completed, and I hope we all are. Reading them and reminding ourselves of what these calls are is a positive step, but what I hope that each reader does tonight, tomorrow, and the days that follow is reflect on how you can be that change or catalyst that initiates any one of these calls into action. Yawanko, miigwech, anushik, and thank you. Yawanko, Paula. That was beautiful and very powerfully and powerfully said, and, and Yauko. Uh, I have the honor of introducing Elder Myrna Keknaswe. Elder Keknaswe is from Walpole Island, because you Wanyan territory, and has served as a visiting elder with Western University's Indigenous Student Center and Indigenous Post-Secondary Education Council for more than 10 years. We are honored to hear the words that have been placed on Elder Kignoswe's heart to share with us.
Elder Kick Nosway. Are you here? I do see that she's here. Sorry about that. She, uh, I didn't uh, have her as a panelist. She should be switching over right now. Okay, no problem at all. Thank you. Go ahead, Elder Kicknosway. Okay, you want me to start the video? Oh, there I am. I wondered where I went. One of us shown under one mark on the dock. Ish put in markets and quiet and each the cars, mond o them. The ketchup on and don't you bar. Buddha water me, oh, thou and the shabby quiet and out. This way, the day. My spirit name is Fire Moccasin Woman. I'm from the Loon Clan. My father's the Buddha water me part of me. My mother is the Odawa part of me. And she's Crane Clan, which is Jajak. Uh, I am honored and privileged to acknowledge both of them and all of my ancestors who have walked on this creation before me. In the clan system, um, the, both of my parents are part of the leadership of our, our nation. And I have both parts, both the interior and the exterior um, leadership something that I didn't know about in my early life. My mother went to residential school. The other part is I live on um, the Kedronon territory, which is the delta between Lake St. Clair and the St. Clair River, south of Chemical Valley, Sarnia, Ontario. I'm also a uh, third degree Medewin. That is a, a choice I made quite a few years ago, because as you're now listening to these calls for action, there I was also answering a call myself. Uh, I wanted to, it to stop here with me, for my children, my grandchildren, and my future generations. It stops here. And so that's the choice I made. So I did, I have done since that time, pursue those things that will make a change. One of the things that uh, I've done over, over time is dealt with students, staff, individuals that have come in my path. And we did some healing work, if you would call it that. But it's finding out where all of those obstacles are inside of us. And we all have them. We all are under the influence of colonization, whether you are indigenous or non-indigenous. The four colors of man are all impacted. So with this tonight, I'd like to offer these words of prayer because we are all here. We are all here to learn, to grow, to change, to make a better future for those ones coming behind us. If you can take a few moments just to ground yourself Connect to the earth because we are all connected to the earth. The earth is who we, we live on, who we understand. And it's those things, those connections that build relationship with us and for us around the world globally. So take a few moments to do a few breaths. And as you breathe in, breathe in through your nose, you hold it. And then you, you blow out, blow out. When you breathe in, you're breathing all the positive energy of creation. When you blow out, you let go of all the negativity that you might be holding or carrying in the vessel that you, you walk around in. So take a few moments to do the breath as I do the opening words. Oh, Abhishuma Shamas. Ishkute Makasan clan, these the cars, mondo them, the Kajadan and Dunjaba. Buddha water me, oh, thou and Nishnavi clan, thou. The sweet, who they are. Oh, Chimmy Gwach Kajem Nado. Chimmy Gwach for all that you have provided to us this day. From the sky world to the earth plane to the underground. 
to all of those things we see and all those things we cannot see. I say chimigwetch to you. Chimigwetch for watching over us and keeping us safe and bringing us all here together. Chimigwetch for the sun that travels across the sky during the day, the moon that travels across the sky during the night, and our most precious earth, the one who provides sustenance for all of us all over the world, the water we drink, the air we breathe, and the food we eat, providing all the medicines to us to help us grow, change, and heal from all of those things that we have picked up in an unhealthy way. I say to me, much to you for providing all that. The earth, our mother. I say to me, much to you. Jimmy Gretsch for the four directions, the east, the south, the west, and the north, the four colors of man, the yellow, the red, the black, and the white. For all of those Mishomsag and Nokomisag that have lived on this land for hundreds and thousands of years, all those ones who have stepped one foot on this creation are watching over us and are connected to all of us as we do our work on a daily basis. I say chimigwetch to them and ask their help to guide us and watch over us as we do this work about these calls of action, those calls that are important not only to Indigenous people, but the people of the world, the ones who, who may think they are not colonized, but yet they are. That awakening is happening. The earth is happening. She's showing us who she is and the healing that we all need to do. I say chimigwetch too. Create the creator who has created all things, the plants, the animals, the medicines, and the herbs, the two-legged, the four-legged, the winged ones that fly in the air, things that crawl in the earth, things that swim in water. I say to me, Gretch, to you, and Mommy Gwendam, I'm so grateful for all that you have given us. I'm so grateful for all of those things. Watch over us and keep us all safe. Help us. <coughs> in our own understanding where creation is at right now. Help us and watch over us to keep us so that we can become globally one heart, one body, one mind, one spirit, one soul, and one voice in relationship with each other, in peace, in harmony, friendship, balance, and most of all, the love of all the earth in all of creation, from the sky world to the earth plane to the underground. Chimigwetch to all of those ones who are looking kindly in our direction and are waiting to help us pick up those pieces that you left behind for us to know and share with others. I say Chimigwetch to you for taking care of us. Yakanagana, all my relations. Thank you. Chimigwetch, that was beautiful. And um, yes, thank you so much. We needed that. Um, so much wisdom. And I loved what you said about um, we are all impacted by colonization. And it's true. And thank you for grounding us and for giving us a blessing for this evening. Finally, we will hear from Dave Malloy who is president of King's University College at Western, before we start reading the calls. Thank you, Carla. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge that I am a, a settler here on Turtle Island, whose ancestors immigrated here from Ireland at the time of the Imperial Treaty of 1752, uh, made with the Mi'kmaq people of Shunam, Shubu, pardon me, Shuban, Acadia. I was born in Treaty 1 territory in Gimli, Manitoba, and grew up within the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation in present-day Ottawa. And since then, until my arrival in London, I've had the privilege of raising my family within Treaty 4 territory in Regina. So I'd like to thank um, 
all of you for, for joining us tonight. I, I, uh, I'd like to thank you all for giving me the honor to, uh, to say a few words to you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers so very much, particularly the students. Um, Carla, a particular thank you to you for all the hard work that you've done. This is uh, a momentous event that you've organized and uh, I really appreciate everything that, that, uh, that you've done to put this together. Um, in, uh, in thinking about my remarks today, uh, I continue to reflect on uh, an event that we had in September where um, I think one of Canada's great leaders, Chief Cad, Mr. Lorm, uh, addressed our community in, uh, in the Veritas lecture. Um, if, if you didn't have the chance to see this lecture in person, um, please access uh, our, our webpage at King's under the Veritas lecture series. Um, this was an outstanding, outstanding speech, uh, full of wisdom. Um, and uh, Chief Delorme is, is a delightful person and uh, I, I learned so much from him and I suspect all of us uh, would learn from listening to his conversation. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the comments that I'd like to read to you in a moment that I, I really have been reflecting on quite a bit um, was, uh, was all about uh, the notion of um, education and truth, and maybe more accurately, uh, the lack of it with regard to adults uh, and, and perhaps adults older than the current generation of, of high school and university students. Um, who have become so knowledgeable about, about treaties, about residential schools and uh, tragedies that have befallen the Indigenous community for, uh, for centuries. Um, and this, this very simple comment, um, I've certainly taken to heart and I, I would hope that all of us would. And, and I quote, he said, we have to understand and teach our kids that we are now the students as adults because we weren't taught the truth. So what, what this says to me um, is, is that uh, it's so important that we, we accept our, our, uh, our lack of knowledge in a very humble way, and that we constant, constantly seek out the truth and that we take action, um, not only at, at King's University, uh, but obviously uh, across society and across Canada. So on, on behalf of, of uh, faculty, staff, and students, uh, my colleagues at the University, uh, King's University College. I, I wanna thank all of you for uh, attending tonight, uh, all of you for your well wishes, all of you for your time uh, and helping, uh, helping us along this path of, of reconciliation. Uh, we have much to learn and um, a long way to go, but uh, I think there's, um, there's there's a, a strong will for us to continue down this path and um, um, walking arm in arm is is uh, is certainly my my hope uh, for for us tonight. So with that, I'll stop and say thank you very much and uh, I'm really looking forward to this evening proceeding. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Malloy, for that welcome. Uh, we will now begin to read the calls. Uh, we will introduce the reader for each call. When you hear your name, please unmute yourself and turn your video on. Read the call and then mute yourself and turn your video off. Readers, please remember to not read too fast or too slow for the ASL interpreters. And we will begin. In order to redress the legacy of residential schools and advance the process of Canadian reconciliation, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission makes the following calls to action. Call number one, Emily Carruthers. We call upon the federal provincial, territorial, and Aboriginal governments to commit to reducing the number of Aboriginal children in care by monitoring and assessing neglect investigations, providing adequate resources to enable Aboriginal communities and child welfare organizations 
to keep Aboriginal families together where it is safe to do so, and to keep children in culturally appropriate environments, regardless of where they reside. Ensuring that social workers and others who conduct child welfare investigations are properly educated and trained about the history and impacts of residential schools. Ensuring that social workers and others who conduct child welfare investigations are properly educated and trained about the potential for Aboriginal communities and families to provide more appropriate solutions to family healing. Requiring that all child welfare decision makers consider the impact of the residential school experience on children and their caregivers. Call number two, Shore Charno. We call upon the federal government in collaboration with the provinces and territories to prepare and publish annual reports on the number of Aboriginal children, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis who are in care compared with non-Aboriginal children, as well as the reasons for apprehension, the total spending on the preventative and care services by child welfare agencies, and the effectiveness of various interventions. Call number three. Catherine Beverly. We call upon all levels of government to fully implement Jordan's principle. Call number four, Jacob Flindel. We call upon the federal government to enact Aboriginal child welfare legislation that establishes national standards for Aboriginal children apprehension and custody cases and includes principles that affirm the right of Aboriginal governments to establish and maintain their own child welfare agencies, require all child welfare agencies and courts to take the residential school legacy into account in their decision making, and finally establish as an important priority a requirement that placement of Aboriginal children into temporary and permanent care be culturally appropriate. Call number five, Cassandra Dawson. We call upon the federal, provincial, territorial, and Aboriginal governments to develop culturally appropriate parenting programs for Aboriginal families. Call number six, Melanie Frank. We call upon the government of Canada to repeal section 43 of the Criminal Code of Canada. Call number, call number seven, Navin Droom. We call upon the federal government to develop with Aboriginal groups a joint strategy to eliminate educational and employment gaps between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians. Call number eight, Anne-Marie Cope. We call upon the federal government to eliminate the discrepancy in federal education funding for First Nations children being educated on reserves and those First Nations children being educated off reserves. Call number nine, Layla Bloomer. We call upon the federal government to prepare and publish annual reports comparing funding for the education of First Nations children on and off reserves, as well as educational and income attainments of Aboriginal peoples in Canada compared with non-Aboriginal people. Call number 10, Lindsay Matheson. We call upon the federal government to draft new Aboriginal education legislation with the full participation and informed consent of Aboriginal peoples. The new legislation would include a commitment to sufficient funding and would incorporate the following principles. Providing sufficient funding to close identified educational achievement gaps within one generation. Improving education attainment levels and success rates. Call number 11, Jeff Hill. 
developing culturally appropriate curricula, protecting the right to Aboriginal languages, including the teaching of Aboriginal languages as credit courses, enabling parental and community responsibility, control and accountability, similar to what parents enjoy in public school systems, enabling parents to fully participate in the education of their children, respecting, respecting and honoring treaty relationships. Call number 11, Shay Morgan. We call upon the federal government to provide adequate funding to end the blockage of First Nation students seeking a post-secondary education. Call number 12, Claire Gain. We call upon the federal, provincial, territorial, and Aboriginal governments to develop culturally appropriate early childhood education programs for Aboriginal families. Call number 13, Linda Baldwin. We call upon the federal government to acknowledge that Aboriginal rights include Aboriginal language rights. Call number 14, Rachel Sutherland. We call upon the federal government to enact an Aboriginal Languages Act that incorporates the following principles. Aboriginal languages are fundamental and valued and a valued element of Canadian culture and society, and there is an urgency to preserve them. Aboriginal language rights are reinforced by treaties. The federal government has a responsibility to provide sufficient funds for Aboriginal language revitalization and preservation. The pres preservation, revitalization, and strengthening of Aboriginal languages and culture are best managed by Aboriginal people and communities. And funding for Aboriginal language initiatives must reflect the diversity of Aboriginal languages. Call number 15, Shauna Lukowitz. Shauna, we don't have any volume. Is that better? Yes, thank you. <laughs> We call upon the federal government to appoint, in consultation with Aboriginal groups, an Aboriginal Languages Commissioner. The Commissioner should help promote Aboriginal languages and report on the adequacy of federal funding of Aboriginal languages initiatives. Call number 16, Marilyn DeCoss. We call upon post-secondary oh, institutions like to create university yeah. and college yeah. degree yeah. and yeah. diploma yeah. programs in Aboriginal languages. Call number 17, Don Marie Welch. We call upon all levels of government to enable residential school survivors and their families to reclaim names changed by the residential school system by waiving administrative costs for a period of five years for the name change process and the revision of official identity documents such as birth certificates, passports, driver's licenses, health cards, status cards, and social insurance numbers. Call number 18. Yaya Dalunya George. We call upon the federal, pro provincial, territorial, and Aboriginal governments to acknowledge that the current state of Aboriginal health in Canada is a direct result of previous Canadian government policies, including residential schools, and to recognize and implement the healthcare rights of Aboriginal people as identified in international law constitutional law and under the treaties. Call number 19, Ardith Breskason. We call upon the federal government in consultation with Aboriginal peoples to establish measurable goals 
to identify and close the gaps in health outcomes between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities and to publish annual progress reports and assess long-term trends. Such efforts would focus on indicators such as infant mortality, maternal health, suicide, mental health, addictions, life expectancy, birth rates, infant and child health issues, chronic diseases, illness and injury incidents, and the availability of appropriate health services. Call number 20, Lori Breskison. In order to address the jurisdictional disputes concerning Aboriginal people who do not reside on reserves, we call upon the federal government to recognize, respect, and address the distinct health needs of the Métis, Inuit, and off-reserve Aboriginal peoples. Call number 20, Kimberly Fisher. We call upon the federal government to provide sustainable funding for existing and new Aboriginal healing centers to address the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual harms caused by residential schools and to ensure that the funding of healing centers in Nunavut and the Northwest Territories is a priority. Call number 22, Scott Cortis. We call upon those who can affect change within the Canadian healthcare system to recognize the value of Aboriginal healing practices and use them in the treatment of Aboriginal patients in collaboration with Aboriginal healers and elders were requested by Aboriginal patients. Call number 23, Lisa Jackson. We call upon all levels of government to increase the number of Aboriginal professionals working in the healthcare field, ensure the retention of Aboriginal healthcare providers in Aboriginal communities, provide cultural competency training for all healthcare professionals. Call number 24, Heather Britton. We call upon medical and nursing schools in Canada to require all students to take a course dealing with Aboriginal health issues, including the history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, treaties and Aboriginal rights, and Indigenous teachings and practices. This will require skills-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. Call number 25, Lucas Kettle. We call upon the federal government to establish a written policy that reaffirms the independence of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police to investigate crimes in which the government has its own interest as a potential or real party in civil litigation. Call number 26, Betsy Odegaard. Okay. We call upon the federal, provincial, and territorial governments to review and amend their respective statutes of limitations to ensure that they conform to the principle that governments and other entities cannot rely on limitation defenses to defend legal actions of historical abuse brought by Aboriginal people. Call number 27. Najia Mohammed. 
we call upon the Federation of Law Societies of Canada to ensure that lawyers receive appropriate cultural competency training, which includes the history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, treaties and Aboriginal rights, Indigenous law and Aboriginal crown relations. This will require skills-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. Call number 28, Robin Hurley. We call upon law schools in Canada to require all law students to take a course in Aboriginal people in the law, which includes the history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, treaties and Aboriginal rights, Indigenous law and Aboriginal crown relations. This will require skills-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. Call number 29, Kate John is hopeless. We call upon the parties and in particular, the federal government, to work collaboratively with plaintiffs not included in the Indian Residential Schools Settlement Agreement to have disputed legal issues determined expeditiously on an agreed set of facts. Call number 30, Sela Khan. We call upon federal, provincial, and territory gov territorial governments to commit to eliminating the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in custody over the next decade, and to issue detailed annual reports that monitor and evaluate progress in doing so. Call number 31, Lisa Macklem. We call upon the federal, provincial and territorial governments to provide sufficient and stable funding to implement and evaluate community sanctions that will provide realistic alternatives to imprisonment for Aboriginal offenders and respond to the underlying causes of offending. Call number 32, Kristen Lozanski. We call upon the federal government to amend the criminal code to allow trial judges upon giving reasons to depart from mandatory minimum sentences and restrictions on the use of conditional sentences. Call number 33, Sheris Lynn Curtis. We call upon the federal, provincial and territorial governments to recognize as a high priority the need to address and prevent fetal alcohol syndrome disorder, FASD, and to develop in collaboration with Aboriginal people, FASD preventative programs that can be delivered in a culturally appropriate manner. Call number 34, Peggy Sattler. We call upon the governments of Canada, the provinces and territories to undertake reforms to the criminal justice system to better address the needs of offenders with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, FASD, including providing increased community resources and powers for courts to ensure that FASD is properly diagnosed and that appropriate community supports are in place for those with FASD enacting statutory exemptions from mandatory minimum sentences of imprisonment for offenders affected by FASD, providing community, correctional, and parole resources to maximize the ability of people with FASD to live in the community, and adopting appropriate evaluation mechanisms to measure the effectiveness of such programs and ensure community safety. Call number 35, Serena Van Shake. We call upon the federal government to eliminate barriers to the creation of additional Aboriginal healing lodges within the federal correctional system. Call number 36, Tamia Shikas.
We call upon the federal, provincial, and territorial governments to work with Aboriginal communities to provide culturally relevant services to inmates on issues such as substance abuse, family and domestic violence, and overcoming the experience of having been sexually abused. Call number 37, Zahi Ali. We call upon the federal government to provide more supports for Aboriginal programming in halfway houses and parole services. Call number 38, Shandell Maxwell. We call upon the federal, provincial, territorial, and Aboriginal governments to commit to eliminating the overrepresentation of Aboriginal youth in custody over the next decade. Call number 39, Braden Lovey. We call upon the federal government to develop a national plan to collect and publish data on the criminal victimization of Aboriginal people, including data related to homicide and family violence victimization. Call number 40, Manny Lebeau. We call on all levels of government in collaboration with the Aboriginal people to create adequately funded and accessible Aboriginal specific victim programs and services with appropriate evaluation mechanism. Call number 41, Daisy Raphael. We call upon the federal government in consultation with Aboriginal organizations to appoint a public inquiry into the causes of and remedies for the disproportionate victimization of Aboriginal women and girls. The inquiry's mandate would include, first, investigation into missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls, and second, links to the intergenerational legacy of residential schools. Call number 42, Russell Duvernoy. We call upon the federal, provincial, and territorial governments to commit to the recognition and implementation of Aboriginal justice systems in a manner consistent with the treaty and Aboriginal rights of Aboriginal peoples, the Constitution Act of 1982, and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, endorsed by Canada in November 2012. Call number 43, Kay Zahn. We call upon federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments to fully adopt and implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a framework for reconciliation. Call number 44, Thakhat Hoth. We call upon the Government of Canada to develop a national action plan, strategies, and other concept measure to achieve the goal of the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous peoples. Call number 45, Jeff Reed. We call upon the Government of Canada on behalf of all Canadians, to jointly develop with Aboriginal peoples a royal proclamation of reconciliation to be issued by the Crown. The proclamation would build on the Royal Proclamation of 1763 and the Treaty of Niagara of 1764 and reaffirm the nation to nation relationship between Aboriginal peoples and the Crown. The proclamation would include, but not be limited to, the following elements repudiate concepts used to justify European sovereignty over indigenous uh, lands and peoples, such as the doctrine of discovery and terra nullius. Second, adopt and implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as the frame framework for re reconciliation. Third, renew or establish treaty relationships based on principles of mutual recognition, mutual respect, and shared responsibility for maintaining those relationships into the future. And fourth, reconcile Aboriginal and Crown constitutional and legal orders to ensure that Aboriginal peoples are full partners in Confederation. 
including the recognition and integration of indigenous laws and legal traditions in negotiation and implementation processes involving treaties, land claims, and other constructive agreements. Call number 46, Jane, sorry, Jan Evans. We call upon the parties to the Indian Residential Schools Settlement Agreement to develop and sign a covenant of reconciliation that would identify principles for working collaboratively to advance reconciliation in Canadian society, and that would include, but not be limited to, reaffirmation of the party's commitment to reconciliation, repudiation of concepts used to justify European sovereignty over Indigenous lands and peoples, such as the doctrine of discovery and terra nullius, and the reformation of laws, governance structures, and policies within their respective institutions that continue to rely on such concepts. Full adoption and implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as the framework for reconciliation. To support for the renewal or establishment of treaty relationships based on principles of mutual recognition, mutual respect, and shared responsibility for maintaining those relationships into the future and enabling those excluded from the settlement agreement to sign on to the covenant of reconciliation. And lastly, enabling additional parties to sign on to the covenant of reconciliation. Call number 47, Becky Ong. We call upon federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments to repudiate concepts used to justify European sovereignty over Indigenous peoples and lands, such as the doctrine of discovery and terra nullius, and to reform those laws, government policies, and litigation strategies that continue to rely on such concepts. All number 48, Dave Molloy. We call upon the church parties to the settlement agreement and all other faith groups and interfaith social justice groups in Canada who have not already done so to formally adopt and comply with the principles, norms, and standards of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a framework for reconciliation. This would include, but not be limited to, the following commitments. Ensuring that their institutions, policies, programs, and practices comply with the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Respecting Indigenous Peoples' right to self-determination in spiritual matters, including the right to practice, develop, and teach their own spiritual and religious traditions, customs, and ceremonies consistent with Article 12.1 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Engaging in the ongoing public dialogue and actions to support the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and issuing a statement no later than March 31st, 2016, uh, quite some time ago, from all the religious denominations and faith groups as to how they will implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. All number 49, to Sorensen. We call upon all religious denominations and faith groups who have not already done so to repudiate concepts used to justify European sovereignty over Indigenous lands and peoples, such as the doctrine of discovery and terra nullius. Call number 50, Hannah Foster. In keeping with the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, we call upon the federal government in collaboration with orig Aboriginal organizations to fund the establishment of Indigenous law institutions for the development, use, and understanding of Indigenous laws and access to justice in accordance with the unique cultures of Aboriginal peoples in Canada. 
Ball number 51, Kathy Peters. We call upon the Government of Canada as an obligation of its fiduciary responsibility to develop a policy of transparency by publishing legal opinions it develops and upon which it acts or intends to act in regard to the scope and extents of Aboriginal and treaty rights. Call number 52, Sharon Debra. We call upon the Government of Canada, provincial and territorial governments, and the courts to adopt the following legal principles. Aboriginal title claims are accepted once the Aboriginal claimant has established occupation over a particular territory as a particular point in time. Once Aboriginal title has been established, the burden of proving any limitation on any rights arising from the existence of that title shifts to the party asserting such a limitation. Call number 53, Teresa Armstrong. We, we call upon the Parliament of Canada in consultation with the Ab Aboriginal peoples to enact legislation to establish a National Council for Reconciliation. The legislation establish the Council as an independent national oversight body with membership jointly appointed by the Government of Canada and national Aboriginal organizations and consisting of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal members. Its mandate would include, but not be limited to the following. One, evaluate and report annually to Parliament and the people of Canada on the Government of Canada's post-apology progress on record to ensure that government accountability for reconciling the relationship between Aboriginal peoples and the Crown is maintained in the coming years. Two, monitor and report to Parliament and the people of Canada on reconciliation progress across all levels and sectors of Canadian society, including the implementation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's calls to action. Three, develop and implement a multi-year national action plan for reconciliation, which includes research and policy development, public education programs, and resources. Four, promote public dialogue, public-private partnerships, and public initiatives for reconciliation. All 54, Kay Rayburge. We call upon the Government of Canada to provide multi-year funding for the National Council for Reconciliation to ensure that it has the financial, human, and technical resources required to conduct its work including the endowment of a National Reconciliation Trust to advance the cause of reconciliation. Call 55, Irene Matheson. We call upon all levels of government to provide annual reports or any current data requested by the National Council for Reconciliation so that it can report on the progress towards reconciliation. The reports or data would include, but not be limited to, the number of Aboriginal children, including Métis and Inuit children in care, compared with non-Aboriginal children, the reasons for apprehension, and the total spending on preventative and care services by child welfare agencies. Comparative funding for the education of First Nations children on and off reserves, the educational and income attainments of Aboriginal peoples in Canada compared with non-Aboriginal peoples, progress on closing the gaps between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities in a number of health indicators, such as infant mortality, maternal health, suicide, mental health, addictions, life expectancy, 
birth rates, infant and child health issues, chronic diseases, illness and injury incidents, and the availability of appropriate health services. Progress on eliminating the overrepresentation of Aboriginal children in youth custody over the next decade. Progress on reducing the rate of criminal victimization of Aboriginal people, including data related to homicide and family violence victimization and other crimes. Progress on reducing the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in the justice and correctional systems. All 56, Sherry Moore. We call upon the Prime Minister of Canada to formally respond to the report of the National Council for Reconciliation by issuing an annual State of Aboriginal Peoples Report, which would outline the government's plans for advancing the cause of reconciliation. All 57. Krista Arnold. We call upon federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments to provide education to public servants on the history of Aboriginal peoples, including the history and legacy of residential schools. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples treaties and Aboriginal rights, Indigenous law, and Aboriginal crown relations. This will require skills-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. All 58, Ryan Shavera. We call upon the Pope to issue an apology to survivors, their families, and communities for the Roman Catholic Church's role in the spiritual, cultural, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children in Catholic-run residential schools. We call for that apology to be similar to the 2010 apology issued to Irish victims of abuse and to occur within one year of the issuing of this report and to be delivered by the Pope in Canada. All 59, Sue Hillis. We call upon church parties to the settlement agreement to develop ongoing education strategies to ensure that their respective congregations learn about their church's role in colonization, the history and legacy of residential schools, and why apologies to former residential school students, their families, and communities were necessary. Call number 60, Lisette Koa. We call upon leaders of the church uh, parties to the settlement agreement and all other faiths in collaboration with Indigenous spiritual leaders, survivors, schools of theology, seminaries, and other religious training centers to develop and teach curriculum for all student clergy and all clergy and staff who work in Aboriginal communities on the need to respect Indigenous spirituality in its own right, the history and legacy of residential schools, and the roles of the church parties in, this, in that system, the history and legacy of religious conflict in Aboriginal families and communities, and the responsibility that churches have to mitigate such conflicts and prevent spiritual violence. Call number 61, Jonathan Sears. We call upon church parties to the settlement agreement in collaboration with survivors and representatives of Aboriginal organizations to establish permanent funding to Aboriginal people for community-controlled healing and reconciliation projects, community-controlled culture and language revitalization projects, community-controlled education and relationship building projects, regional dialogues for Indigenous spiritual leaders and youth 
to discuss indigenous spirituality, self-determination, and reconciliation. Call number 62, Corey Dehosky. We call upon the federal, provincial, and territorial governments in consultation and collaboration with survivors, Aboriginal peoples, and educators to make age-appropriate curriculum on residential schools, treaties, and Aboriginal peoples' historical and contemporary contributions to Canada, a mandatory education requirement for kindergarten to grade 12 students. Two, provide the necessary funding to post-secondary institutions to educate teachers on how to integrate Indigenous knowledge and teaching methods into classrooms. Three, provide the necessary funding to Aboriginal schools to utilize Indigenous knowledge and teaching methods in classrooms. Four, establish senior level positions in government at the assistant deputy minister level or higher dedicated to Aboriginal content in education. Call number 63, Jess Natwell. We call upon the Council of Ministers of Education Canada to maintain an annual commitment to Aboriginal education issues, including developing and implementing kindergarten to grade 12 curriculum and learning resources on Aboriginal peoples in Canada, in Canadian history, and the long history and legacy of residential schools. Sharing information and best practices on teaching curriculum related to residential schools and Aboriginal history. Building student capacity for intercultural understanding, empathy, and mutual respect. Identifying teacher training needs relating to the above. All number 64, and a first slide. We call upon all levels of government that provide public funds to denominational schools to require such schools to provide an education on comparative religious studies, which must include a segment on Aboriginal spiritual beliefs and practices developed in collaboration with Aboriginal elders. Call number 65, Alvin Wright. We call upon the federal government through the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council and in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples, post-secondary institutions and educators, and the National Truth and Reconciliation and its partner institutions to establish a national research program for multi-year funding to advance understanding of reconciliation. All number 66. Shauna Lukowitz. We call upon the federal government for community-based youth organizations to deliver programs on reconciliation and establish a national network to share information and best practices. Call number 67, Chantel Moxley. We call upon the federal government to provide funding to the Canadian Museums Association to undertake, in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples, a national review of museum policies and best practices to determine the level of compliance with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and to make recommendations. Call number 68, Kobe Dowdell. We call upon the federal government in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples and the Canadian Museums Association to mark the 150th anniversary of Canadian Confederation in 2017 by establishing a dedicated national funding program for commemoration projects on the theme of reconciliation. Call number 69, Martha Gordon. We call upon Library and Archives Canada to one, 
fully adopt and implement the Na United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the United Nations Joine Orland Liquor Principles as related to Aboriginal peoples' inalienable rights to know the truth about what happened and why with regard to human rights violations committed against them in the residential schools. Two, ensure that its record holdings related to residential schools are accessible to the public. And three, commit more resources to its public education materials and programming on residential schools. Call number 70, John Hang. We call upon the federal government to provide funding to the Canadian Association of Archivists to undertake, in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples, a national review of archival policies and best practices to determine the level of compliance with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the United Nations Joanne Orend Liquor Principles as related to Aboriginal peoples' inalienable right to know the truth about what happened and why with regard to human rights violations committed against them in the residential schools. Produce a report with recommendations for full implementation of these international mechanisms as a reconciliation framework for Canadian archives. Call number 71, Denise Gorman. We call upon all chief coroners and provincial vital statistics agencies that have not provided to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada their records on the deaths of Aboriginal children in the care of residential school authorities to make these documents available to the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation. Call number 72, Morena Hernandez. We call upon the federal government to allocate sufficient resources to the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation to allow it to develop and maintain the National Residential School Student Death Register, established by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Call number 73, Zarish Girard. We call upon the federal government to work with churches, Aboriginal communities and former residential school students to establish and maintain an online registry of residential school cemeteries, including where possible, maps showing the location of deceased residential school children. All number 74, Sherry Smith. We call upon the federal government to work with the churches and the Aboriginal community leaders to inform the families of children who died at residential schools of the child's burial location and to respond to the family's wishes for appropriate commemoration ceremonies and markers and reburial in home communities where requested. All number 75, Cheryl Wittwick. We call upon the federal government to work with provincial, territorial, and municipal governments, churches, Aboriginal communities, former residential school students, and current landowners to develop and implement strategies and procedures for the ongoing identification, documentation, maintenance, commemoration, and protection of residential school cemeteries were other sites at which residential school children were buried. This is to include the provision of appropriate memorial ceremonies and commemorative markers to honor the deceased children. Call number 76, 
Rafisnin. We call upon the parties engaged in the work of documenting, maintaining, commemorating, and protecting residential school cemeteries to adopt strategies in accordance with the following principles. One, the Aboriginal community most affected shall lead the development of such strategies. Two, information shall be sought from residential school survivors and other knowledge key development of such strategies. Three, Aboriginal protocols shall be respected before any potentially invasive technical inspection and investigation be site. Call number 77, Quinn Merrill. We call upon provincial, territorial, municipal, and community archives to work collaboratively with the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation to identify and collect copies of all records relevant to the history and legacy of residential school of the residential school system and to provide these to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. All number 78, Maria Chauvaz. We call upon the government of Canada to commit to making a funding contribution of $10 million over seven years to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, plus an additional amount to assist communities to research and produce histories of their own residential school experience and their involvement in truth, healing, and reconciliation. All number 79, Isabella Spensieri. We call upon the federal government in collaboration with survivors, Aboriginal organizations, and the arts community to develop a reconciliation framework for Canadian heritage and commemoration. This would include, but not be limited to, amending the Historic Sites and Monuments Act to include First Nations, Inuit, and Métis representation on the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada and its Secretariat, revising the policies, criteria, and practices of the National Program of Historical Commemoration to integrate Indigenous history, heritage values, and memory practices into Canada's national heritage and history. Developing and implementing a National Heritage Plan and Strategy for commemorating residential school sites, the history and legacy of residential schools, and the contributions of Aboriginal peoples to Canada's history. All number 80, Jennifer Pilling. We call upon the federal government in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples to establish as a statutory holiday a National Day for Truth and Reconciliation to honor survivors, their families, and communities, and ensure that public commemoration of the history and legacy of residential schools remains a vital component of the reconciliation process. All number 81, Maria Kalaja. We call upon the federal government in collaboration with survivors and their organizations and other parties to the settlement agreement to commission and install a publicly accessible, highly visible residential schools national monument in the city of Ottawa to honor survivors and all the children who are lost to their families and communities. All number 82, Dennis Greco. We call upon the provincial and territorial governments in collaboration with survivors and their organizations and other parties to the settlement agreement to commission and install a publicly accessible, highly visible residential schools monument in each capital city to honor survivors and all the children who were lost to their families 
and communities. Call number 83, Veronica Antipola. We call upon the Canada Council for the Arts to establish as a funding priority, a strategy for Indigenous and non-Indigenous artists to undertake collaborative projects and produce works that contribute to the reconciliation process. Call number 84, Aaron Mullen. We call upon the federal government to restore and increase funding to the CBC Radio Canada to enable Canada's national public broadcaster to support reconciliation and be properly reflective of the diverse cultures, languages, and perspectives of Aboriginal peoples, including, but not limited to, increasing Aboriginal programming, including Aboriginal language speakers, increasing equitable access for Aboriginal peoples to jobs, leadership positions, and professional development opportunities within the organization, continuing to provide dedicated news coverage and online public information resources on issues of concern to Aboriginal peoples and all Canadians, including the history and legacy of residential schools and the reconciliation process. Call number 85, Ron Corsin. We call upon the Aborig Aboriginal People's Television Network as an independent nonprofit broadcaster with programming by, for, and about Aboriginal peoples to support reconciliation, including, but not limited to, one, continuing to provide leadership in programming and organizational culture that reflects the diverse cultures, languages, and perspectives of Aboriginal peoples, two, Continuing to develop media initiatives that inform and educate the Canadian public and connect Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians. Call number 86, Simran Sidhu. I believe you're uh, muted still. Sorry. Um we call upon Canadian journalism schools and media schools to require education for all students on the history of Aboriginal people, including the history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations Declaration, and the rights of Indigenous people, treaties and Aboriginal rights, Indigenous laws, and Aboriginal Crown relief. Call number 87, James Vinche. We call upon all levels of government in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples, sports halls of fame, and other relevant organizations to provide public education that tells the national story of Aboriginal athletes in history. All number 88, Sarah Hanassi. We call all levels of government to take action to ensure long-term Aboriginal athlete development and growth and continued support for the North American Indigenous Games, including funding to host the Games, and territorial team preparation and travel. All number 89, Shirley Sherman. We call upon the federal government to amend the Physical Activity and Sport Act to support reconciliation by ensuring that policies to promote physical activity as a fundamental element of health and well being, reduce barriers to sports participation, increase the pursuit of excellence, and build capacity in the Canadian sports system are inclusive of Aboriginal peoples. All number 90. Danielle Ross. We call upon the federal government to ensure that national sports policies, programs, and initiatives are inclusive of Aboriginal peoples, 
including but not limited to establishing in collaboration with provincial and territorial governments, stable funding for and access to community sports programs that reflect the diverse cultures and traditional sporting activities of Aboriginal peoples, and a, an elite athletic development program for Aboriginal athletes, programs for coaches, trainers, and sports officials that are culturally relevant for Aboriginal peoples, and anti-racism awareness and training programs. Hall number 91, Céline Poirier. Nous demandons aux hauts dirigeants et aux pays d'accueil de manifestations sportives internationales comme les Jeux olympiques, les Jeux du Commonwealth et les Jeux panaméricains de veiller à ce que les protocoles territoriaux des peuples autochtones soient respectés et à ce que les collectivités autochtones locales participent à tous les aspects de la planification et de la tenue de ces événements. Call number 92, David Ferreira. We call upon the corporate sector in Canada to adopt the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People as a reconciliation framework and to apply its principles, norms, and standards to corporate policy and core operational activities involving Indigenous peoples and their lands and resources. This would include, but not limited to, the following. One, commit to meaningful consultation building respectful relationships and obtaining the free, prior and informed consent of Indigenous peoples before proceeding with economic development projects. Two, ensure that Aboriginal peoples have equitable access to jobs, training and education opportunities in the corporate sector and that Aboriginal communities gain long-term sustainable benefits from economic development projects. Three, Provide education for management and staff on the history of Aboriginal peoples, including the history and legacy of reg residential schools, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, treaties and Aboriginal rights, Indigenous law, and Aboriginal crown relations. This will require skills-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. Call number 93, Carla Lapa. We call upon the federal government in collaboration with the National Aboriginal Organizations to revise the information kit for bring to Canada and its citizenship and its citizenship test a more inclusive history of the diverse Aboriginal peoples of Canada, including information about the treaties and the history of residential schools. Call 94, Kate Debra. We call upon the government of Canada to replace the oath of citizenship with the following i swear or affirm that i will be faithful and bear true allegiance to her majesty queen elizabeth ii queen of canada her peers and successors and that i will faithfully observe the laws of canada including treaties with indigenous peoples and fulfill my duties as a canadian citizen Thank you all so much for that. That is a lot to ingest and digest. And thank you everybody for your participation and your patience. As we sit with the calls that were just read, um, Dr. Robert Ventresca, uh, history professor and academic dean at King's University College will give some closing remarks. Thank you to everyone for your participation and your uh, presence at this public reading of the 94 
calls to action. Um, it's really a sign of hope uh, to see so many people from such a diverse range of places and positions um, gathered here and engaged in tonight's reading of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to action. Justice Murray Sinclair, chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, has repeatedly stated that it's only through ongoing truth telling that reconciliation with Indigenous peoples in Canada can become a reality. Uh, education, uh, Justice Sinclair says, holds the key to reconciliation. Universities have a particular role to play uh, in the work of reconciliation. Uh, as a historian and an educator, I know that truth seeking and truth telling must proceed and accompany the work of reconciliation. And I think because of its Catholic origins, King's has a special responsibility to be a, a place and a space for truth telling and truth seeking uh, and for acknowledging openly many uncomfortable truths about the role that Christian educational institutions played as instruments of colonial control uh, and violence. As President Malloy said earlier, um, Chief Cadmus Delorme of, of Kawasa's First Nation visited Kings uh, earlier this year uh, and spoke about the challenges of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. And in his talk, he framed reconciliation uh, and its responsibilities um, by acknowledging that while those of us in the room were not the ones who created residential schools, we have inherited its legacies. And so we have a responsibility to participate in redressing the intergenerational and ongoing harms of historic injustices. I want to say thank you to all of the readers of this evening's event. Uh, a special word of thanks to Carla and to all the organizers, the students of our social justice and peace studies program here at King's University College. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, and thank you for your patience. And uh, we hope to see you again next year. Um, as we sign off, uh, we have posted some supports, um, if it is helpful to anyone to access them. These events are important and they also stir up and trigger unpleasant feelings or thoughts. Please use these services if needed. They are there as a support. I want to thank especially my team, Allison Larkin, Shauna Lukowitz, Sean Hoopter, Laura Hansford, Chantel Moxley, Connor Galloway, and Serena Van Shaik. And I want to also have a special thanks to our ASL interpreters, Jordan Goldman and Rana Ramdi. And lastly, and not least, to Adam Taylor, our IT specialist who made this happen tonight. Thank you, everybody. Mikwech and Nushik, Yalko, peace and health to all. Good evening.